Good morning, everyone. I am so delighted to be here this morning that I woke up an hour before my alarm was set to go off. I'm sure all of you did exactly the same thing. Right? No? Okay. If you have your Bible, please turn to Revelation. Yes, very exciting. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of risk we could take with that, but we're not going to take any risks today. We're going to be right near the end of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22. We'll be reading some from there and really setting up kind of what we're going to be doing all week. I mentioned last night we're going to be talking about God's presence. And maybe that's something you've thought a lot about. Maybe it's something you haven't thought a whole lot about. But I have a question. Uh, I, first thing in the morning, it's not fair to ask what is... It's not really a trick question. It's only if you don't know the answer that's a trick question. Um, where will Christians live forever? Yes. Heaven. That is close. Where... That's why I said it's only a trick question. Where will Christians live forever? Yes. Okay, the new heavens and the new earth. So you weren't wrong, right? So the new heavens and the new earth. You can put your hands down. Christians will live forever with God in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, it's not wrong to think about when we die, where will we be? We will be with the Lord. That's what Paul accented right when he said, I don't know whether I want to go or stay. I really do want to go because that will mean, absent with the body, will mean being present with the Lord. He says, but for now, I'm going to stay because that will be more fruitful for you. So when we die, we go immediately into God's presence in what we would call heaven, what we think of as heaven. But what we'll see here in Revelation 21 and 22 is that the story of the Bible is not man going up to heaven. It is heaven coming down to earth. That may be kind of a brand new concept for some of you. And actually, there's a way in which that ties together the story of the entire Bible. This week, what we want to do is unfold the story of God's presence, His plan for His presence, and to live with us forever. And then to think about the implications, what difference that should make as you live today, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and on and on until the day that you see Jesus face to face. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I learned Bible stories as largely disconnected from one another. I learned lots of stories. I, you, know, you know the Exodus and kind of how that all fits. And as long as Moses lived, of course, all the stories are related to one another. And it goes on to Joshua. But then you, you learn about there were good kings and there were bad kings. There was Jonah, but where does he fit into anything in the timeline? Right? We're much more aware of like the timeline, the sacred timeline in Marvel movies than we are in the Bible, right? And once they started messing with the timeline, it got really confusing and most people stopped watching at that point, right? What day is it? What century am I in? How many times have we been here? Seems like a thousand. For Loki, sometimes it was. Just over and over. <laughs> One of my favorite moments was, I've been falling for 30 minutes, right? And if you haven't seen that one, that's okay. But what happens, right? When we have our favorite movies, we love to see the whole story. And we have our favorite moments that we quote, and I know some of you quote uh, movies to each other even while you're here at Chehi, and I think that's, that's acceptable in the handbook to do that, right? We love our moments. I wasn't at Chehi 101, so I don't know for sure. Uh, but we have our moments that we love and we enjoy, right? And there are certain movies where, oh, I love this scene. Right? It's so well shot. It's so well acted. It's so good. And my kids know which scenes those are in which movies. We're just, uh, this one's going to be great. Right? But what really makes it great is that it's part of a story. And we care very much about that with our movies, even the movies that spread out over you know, 15 years. We want them all to make sense and we want them to fit together. I grew up not really feeling that way about my Bible. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that Jesus died on the cross to save me. I knew that I'd be in heaven with Him one day. And I knew loads 
of stories. If you've grown up in a Christian home, going to church every week, going to Sunday school, you know loads of stories. And for me, those stories were very disconnected from each other. Almost like Aesop's fables, right? Stories meant to teach a moral lesson, to help kids stay out of trouble, but one really didn't relate much to the next. But all those seemingly disconnected stories are actually telling one big story. The story of God's relentless, faithful love for people People who only deserve His wrath. Who only deserve His absence. We get, by His grace, His presence. It's the story of God's people living with Him in His place. Under His good rule. With His presence. Forever. Now there are many through lines in the story of the Bible. Threads that can be traced, woven throughout the narrative of the Bible's big story. Themes like faith, or place, land, people, sacrifice, kingdom, curse, light, and darkness. And we'll touch on some of those as we go along this week, because all of them intersect with one another. But the one I want to focus on, and perhaps one that maybe you haven't thought much about, I almost hope that you haven't, so that you learn a lot this week, is the presence of God. If someone asks you, you do you know what the Bible teaches about God's presence and His plans for all His people? Ah, maybe a little bit. And perhaps more personally, are you aware of God's presence in your life now, today, this morning? Or is life just something you do by yourself? God's presence is what we were made for. You think all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. God makes the world. And He fills it with good and beautiful, wonderful things. And at the end, He calls it good. And on the sixth day, He creates man and all the animals. In chapter 2, He parades all those animals past Adam to name. And then He gives Adam a wife. Eve. But what did they do in the garden? We really get the hint of it in chapter 3 at the fall. When after they had sinned, they heard the sound of the Lord God in the garden, in the cool of the day, in the evening. And what did they do that time? They hid from God's presence. Because they knew they had sinned. They knew they couldn't walk with Him apparently like they always did. So what was going on at the very beginning? God made a garden. A garden of delight, of beauty. And what made it best was that He was there. And they spent time with Him every single day. Walking with God. Talking with God. Knowing God. With nothing wrong. Nothing to mess up that fellowship. We don't know how long that happened. But we do know that once they fell into sin, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow, that they knew instinctively that they could not be in God's presence anymore. It's what we were made for. It's what we lost in the fall. But even then, they hid from the presence of the Lord. But what happened? God called to them. He called to them. He said, where are you? Not because he didn't know, but because he wanted their hearts to come home. After the fall, God's presence appears somewhat sporadically, right? He's the, Abraham is called the friend of God, and God would sometimes appear to him. Or we think of God's spirit coming on people for periods of time, right? We think of Samson. Right? He had God's power and he didn't even know when he'd lost it because he had gone so far from God. It wasn't all about his hair. It was about God's Spirit. David, after he had sinned against Bathsheba and against her husband Uriah, when he finally was confronted about it and confessed and repented, what does he say to God? Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So there's a sense of God's presence that could be known, that could be felt, but that could be temporary, that could be taken away. 
But we also see God's presence in other places through the story. So we have from the fall, it's lost, and where is God, and where are we in relation to God? But God's presence is what was felt at Mount Sinai. As God led His people across the Red Sea, led them to camp around Mount Sinai, that was a place of terror for those people. And one of the things we think about with God's presence, especially with the people who know they are unholy, is that we shouldn't be here. They were scared even to touch the mountain. Anyone who touched the mountain would die. And His presence was indicated by darkness and clouds and lightning and thunder. And they were in awe before God's holy presence. That's certainly one of the responses that we should have to standing in front of the God of the universe. But His presence was also pictured on that journey from Egypt to the Promised Land in a tent, in the tabernacle. Every time they would stop to camp, right? they were being led actually by God's presence, right? There's the pillar. What were the pillars of? What was one? Cloud. What was the other one? Fire. Okay. Pillar of cloud and fire. And that's how they knew God was leading them. And the pillar of cloud would travel ahead of them and the fire would be there by night. And wherever it stopped, that's where they would camp. And along the way, God gave them the instructions for the tabernacle, the place where He would live, the place where the Holy of Holies would be the central place of sacrifice where God's wrath could be appeased through sacrifice so that He could continue to dwell with His people. And one of my favorite uh, pictures thinking of that time is whenever they would stop for the night, they would build the tabernacle and then there'd be three tribes, three tribes, three tribes, Three tribes. So that if you looked at the tabernacle and the children of Israel on Google Maps, uh, which didn't exist then, what you would see is a picture of what God always made us to be. God living in the middle of His people. Skip forward to the days of the temple. Right? So the tabernacle was a tent that they would set up and they would strike and then they would carry with them on the journey. In the days of Solomon, the temple was built and that was meant to be the permanent place of God's presence, which leads us to think about, like, well, wait a minute, does God really live in a temple? Does God really live in a building? And Solomon even acknowledged that. Our verse for this summer from 2 Chronicles 5, the context of that is the dedication of the temple. The temple was being finished in Jerusalem, the singers were singing, the trumpeters were trumpeting, there were those other instruments as well, and God's presence fills the temple. And in the next chapter, in chapter 6, we see the same thing in response to Solomon's prayer. And God's presence was signified by a cloud, but even Solomon acknowledged in Second Chronicles 2. It's like, we're building this. As he was writing to Hiram, king of Tyre, asking for materials for this temple. He says, I'm building a house for God. Not that even heaven and the highest heaven can contain him. And some of you may be thinking this whole time, you're like, wait, I know something you apparently don't know. God is what we call, here's my fancy theological term for that, omnipresent. Right? And some of you, you know that already, right? And you're probably thinking like, this guy, he's talking about God's presence like it's a thing in a particular place and time. And yes, it's true. God is omnipresent. Psalm 139 is a key text for that one. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Even if I make my bed in the grave, you are there. There's nowhere we can go to get away from God. And at the same time, while that is true, and God is everywhere, which is hard for us to imagine. He's like, all around us even now, but He's where you're from and He's where He'll be in five years. He's everywhere. And yet, the Bible speaks of His presence differently than that too. So yes, He's present everywhere all the time, seeing everything, knowing everything, superintending everything. But there is also God's gracious presence. His presence of blessing. And that's really what we're talking about 
this week. Not so much the Psalm 139. He's everywhere. But what does it mean to be in His presence? Skip forward to when Jesus came. We're told in John 1 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And if you were to look at that, if you have an ESV, you'd see a little note that says, dwelt could also be tabernacled. Like tabernacle, that's a weird word to use until you think back to the story. Remember that tabernacle in the middle of God's people? When Jesus came, what's happening? God living in the middle of His people to bless them. Ultimately, to save them. That if they don't have His presence, they don't have anything. And for the years that Jesus lived and walked on this earth, teaching, loving, healing, before dying and rising from the dead, He was the center of God's presence, of God's activity in the middle of His people. And then He ascended to His Father. Before He ascended, He promised that He would send His Holy Spirit. And the Spirit came. And the Spirit lives and works in the church even now. That is the age that we still live in while we wait for Jesus to come again. So where is God's presence now? Individually, His presence is in everyone who belongs to God through faith in Christ alone. And His presence lives collectively in the church. It's one of the reasons we sing hymns like, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing Thy grace. And in our gatherings as a church, we regularly pray and ask for God to be present with us. Because if we don't have Him, we don't have anything. There is nothing I can do or say. There's no liturgical choices that I can make that actually change anyone's heart. Now, we care very deeply about the liturgical choices that we make with the readings, with the songs, with the prayers. We care very deeply and seek to prepare thoroughly for what will happen in the sermons. We think they're very important, but we recognize without God's gracious presence to bless, we have nothing at all. The cross ushered in a new era of access to God. Right? So before it was the tabernacle and the temple. But what happened? There are a lot of things that happened. There's a particular thing that happened. As Jesus died on the cross, specifically related to the temple. Can somebody tell me? I know it's early. Yes. Yes. Which direction was it torn? Yes. Okay, this curtain. And when we think of curtains, like I, uh, I'm not strong enough to rip curtains. Some of you guys look like you are. But when we think of curtains, you know, they're kind of thin, right? You think of curtains hanging maybe in your house somewhere, if that's a thing that people still do. This curtain in the temple was like this thick. It wasn't the kind of thing that would just unravel. And as Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was torn. And the direction is important, and it's noted. (laughs) It's from top to bottom. Because again, if it's a big one, like again, curtains, like I can think, I can reach up and get it. But this curtain was like the wall of the Holy of Holies. That's how you entered in, by pulling back the curtain. But that curtain was torn from top to bottom to bottom, torn by God Himself as His Son died, showing there's a new era, a new day. On the darkest day, a new day was dawning. A day when God would live with His people, not in a place where they would come to Him and be near His presence and where no one could actually go in. Right? Only the high priest could even go into the Holy of Holies. Now the Holy of Holies is being dispersed among everyone who hopes in Jesus. Among everyone who has the Holy Spirit. And it's pointing us forward 
to what we will experience for all eternity. God desires, God intends to live with His people. One of the greatest promises, one of the sweetest words we can hear is, I will be your God and you will be my people. It meant His presence. It meant His power. It meant His protection. It meant His care. It meant His peace. And when Jesus comes again, we will see Him face to face. Is that something you're thinking about? Is that something you are even aware of? Sure, maybe I learned it one day. But are you aware of God's presence? Are you aware of where your life is going? Some of you are getting toward the end of high school and you're thinking like, next steps. Some of you counselors are finished with college or finishing college or even early in your careers, and you're thinking, next steps. What am I going to do? Who am I going to be? Where am I going to go? And that's important. So keep practicing, right? This isn't a don't worry about anything. Keep practicing your instruments. Keep working on the things that you believe God is going to do in and through you. But in that, never lose sight of the biggest things that God is doing. Because you can be great at your instrument and never know God's presence. You can attend church every week and never know God's presence. You can come to Chehi and never know God's gracious presence. Did you know that God's unending presence with us is the centerpiece of God's plan for His people? That it's His presence that makes the darkness flee. That that is what will make the new heavens and the new earth great. The story of the Bible, again, the story of Christianity, is not man reaching up to heaven. That's part of what makes Christianity distinct from every other religion. It's not about what we can do to get to God. It's about what God has done to come after us when we were running away from Him. And He just keeps coming. And He's going to come for us forever. So I want to read some from Revelation 21 and 22. I know that was kind of backwards. I did most of the teaching and it's like, now we're going to look at the Bible. We're kind of like pulling on that thread from Genesis to Revelation. And I want you to see and I want you to feel how this story Ends. Because the endings tell us a lot about what was really going on. I'm not going to spoil any movies that some of you maybe haven't seen. I get in trouble for that sometimes at our church. Yesterday I was giving an illustration and like a 12-year-old girl was sitting in the fourth row like, like, sorry Emma. It wasn't really a spoiler anyway. She just knew she hadn't seen the movie that I mentioned, didn't want to know anything about it. But there are movies, right, where they only make sense when you know the end. And there are movies that are incredibly frustrating because you get to the end and it's like, that is not what was supposed to happen. Can you think of any like that? It's like, that was wrong. There's no way that that can be what this story was about, right? The ending tells you what the story is about. You can have all these things happening and then... If that's what it was about, that's what this was for, are you kidding me? But then there are other ones where you watch and you're like, I don't know, or books you read and they get a little long in the middle. You're like, I'm not sure where this is going. I'm not sure what's happening exactly. And then you find out. And everything makes sense. And everything is okay. So we're going to look at the ending. And these are words you're probably, you probably have heard at some point before. I know Revelation can be like a scary book because there's like 15 million different ways to approach it and everyone thinks they're exactly right and everyone else is the worst and doesn't believe the Bible. But when we think that way, we miss out on a blessing. And so I want to read. We're going to skip around a little bit in these last couple chapters. But Revelation 21, starting in verse 1. This is one of John's visions that he's given from the Lord about what will be. 
says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, listen to this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And we'll talk more about what we lost in the fall tomorrow. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates. At the gates, twelve angels. And on the gates, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The next several verses describe the measuring of the city. And we see that that city, the New Jerusalem, measures to a perfect cube. And we'll come back to that in a second. So remember that. And then verse 22, chapter 21. And I saw no temple in the city. Now what does the temple represent again? God's presence, right? It's His house. It's where He lives. And I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And then verse uh, chapter 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no night of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. That, my friends, is where everything is going to be. But for today, I just want to leave you with that. God made you to know Him. God made you to live with Him and for Him to live with you knowing His gracious presence both now and forever. That's a reality you can know today. And it's a reality that is unstoppably coming when Jesus comes again. Right after we stop reading, there's another reminder. These words are trustworthy and true.
This is the ending that makes everything make sense, that makes everything right. He will be our God, and we will be his people. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you. Thank you that we get to be part of this story, experiencing your presence. Would you help us as we walk through this week, as we practice, as we sing, as we play instruments, as we play games, as we eat food, as we hang out together, as we come together for chapel times, would we be aware that you are present with us even now and that we will live with you and with one another forever. And by your grace, would you make us into the people that you have called us to be, your dwelling place. In Jesus' name, amen.